They called it the Trasafanga Trace. They right. never heard of that battle. They never told it. They never mentioned it. Never have mentioned it. I don't know why, but but uh, we had five cruisers, and that's all the damn ships we had at that time. I'm telling you, we were just about out of ships out there. No aircraft carriers. Uh, the, the carrier that we had, uh, Saratoga, they moved it into an island and said it wasn't to come out of there unless it's extreme emergency. They left it in this island. We were whipped by Japanese destroyers. But as when that battle ended, all four of those cruisers except the Honolulu had been either sunk or badly damaged from out of action. It's it's supposed in the history books. This was the worst naval defeat ever suffered by the U.S. Navy. And they knocked the bow off of the Pensacola, the bow off of the New Orleans, and they sunk the Northampton. And they we were told that we sunk a lot of two or three transports loaded with Japs and everything. Well, it turned out we sunk one destroyer. To the Japanese, Guadalcanal was a most desirable piece of land. Using that island as a base, they might well succeed in severing the lifeline from the U.S. to Australia. The forces of Imperial Japan had been overwhelmingly successful in their ambitious campaigns during that first half year of all-out war. The combined chiefs of staff in Washington were prompted by the enemy threat to the vital U.S. to Australia lifeline to schedule a quick counterblow designed to stop the aggressors short on the South Pacific. Then we were boarded what I thought was a new ship because it had the word new in it, the USS New Orleans. Unbeknownst to me, we were naming heavy cruisers after major cities, New Orleans being one, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, I took care of the searchlights, and that was my battle station. And I had orders to go to the Fletcher which was still being completed at Kearney, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was on there and I commissioned it in 1942 mm -hmm. and uh, spent three years mm -hmm. all on the same ship. Yep. Brand new style of ship. The Fletcher was a, a totally new concept to try and get more firepower and protection along with the torpedoes, because destroyers were torpedo boats before. Mm -hmm. This was a fighting ship, and we were a real fighting ship. We were really good. Well, it was 2,100 ton, oh, or is so that, it was pretty good. It was a destroyer. Yes, okay. mm -hmm. and we could do 37 knots. We could go pretty fast. Mm -hmm. And we had excellent sonar, which was for detecting submarines. Mm -hmm. So we were always out in front of a carrier or, or cruisers or something mm -hmm. else. Uh -huh. Doing the searching for submarines. Yeah. It was a terrific ship and wonderful people. Five, five inch, and we had 40 millimeter, which are brand new. Nobody had those. Mm -hmm. And we had something else that nobody else had before, and that was the 
Sugar George radar, surface search radar. So at midnight, we could still see where all the ships were, oh, mm -hmm. which was magnificent. Yeah. And it was in a room just back of the bridge. Mm -hmm. So that uh, as we trained and headed into battle, the executive officer went against normal procedure. He's supposed to be back on the tail of the ship in case the bridge got shot away mm -hmm. so he can run the ship from back mm -hmm. there. But he was up there with the radar man, and they were telling the captain exactly where he could be, what was there, everything that was going on in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. To the extent you could, once the battle started, you couldn't oh, tell God. anything. Oh, God. <laughs> Unbelievable. The Northampton happened to be in San Diego Bay. And I uh, looked out the window, and I said, man, isn't that a pretty ship? I sure wish we could get on that one. And sure enough, we're put aboard the USS Northampton, and I'm very happy. I'm a very proud crew member. First thing, battle station I had was on a five-inch uh, anti-aircraft gun. I was second loader, which meant I took it out of the fuse pots and handed it to the first loader, and he threw it in the breach, and they fired him. And uh, we had four uh, five-inch 25s on the uh, boat deck, and the Marines had four on the flight deck, which was at least eight feet higher than ours. Let's see, we had five battle stars, Marshalls, Wake Island, Doolittle Raid, Santa Cruz, Midway, and then Tassafaranga is the night we got sunk. Uh, we had five-inch guns, and the director had a range keeper in it, and we had a fire controlman who would operate the range, the, uh, range keeper to determine the uh, course and speed of the target. And when he had a solution, he would report that he had a solution, and then I would order, if we were going to fire, I would order the guns to shift to automatic, and the director would control uh, the horizontal and the vertical of the five-inch guns. And there was a gun captain on each one of the mounts and gave the orders there when to load the guns. Um, my, uh, I was uh, a junior officer to watch on the bridge, and I was officer of the deck in, when we were in port. They had converted a bunch of destroyers, several destroyers, for transport of material and manpower to Guadalcanal. We were they were losing Guadalcanal. Our Marines were, were really fighting a good fight on Guadalcanal. They had already created a landing strip from the Japanese and finished it. Our Navy ship, Navy uh, planes were landing and refueling and rearming and and helping and yeah it was it was a very serious blow to the Japanese to lose that and they were supplying it as best they could with these high speed converted destroyers salute the rising sun throughout their empire throughout newly conquered southeast asia Throughout the South Pacific, the Japanese pause out of respect for their symbol of national superiority. Theirs not to reason why. Theirs but to do and die. And die they will. And die they do in a series of the most terrible sea battles in history. Down from their island fortress to the north, Rabaul, comes the Imperial Japanese Navy with timetable regularity. The Tokyo Express. But sailors of the United States and Australian Navy sacrifice their blood for their brother Marines who cannot hope to control Guadalcanal against an enemy who controls the surrounding seas. Admiral Somerville sent me on a mission 
with Admiral Dennis Boyd, um, who had been captain of the illustrious in the, in the Mediterranean, and I met him then. Uh, and he was um, then appointed flag officer air for the, uh, the aircraft carriers in the Indian Ocean. Admiral Somerville sent him, myself, and uh, one of Admiral Boyd's staff officers uh, to observe American operations against the Japanese uh, in case there was something that, uh, some message I could, we could bring back uh, useful in our training exercises and our general preparation for, for an encounter. I went, flew down to the uh, South Pacific. Well, I think the, one of the feelings uppermost in my mind would be that uh, I was impressed with their readiness to, uh, to, to learn and discuss. Um, I've mentioned earlier that uh, we were, in the British Navy, were thinking up uh, methods of using the information available to us from radar and building it into uh, the ship's systems. Uh, I was able to discuss with Admiral Nimitz staff what we had been doing in the Eastern Fleet uh, where we'd had more time to start doing this Admiral Nimitz's staff were most receptive to our ideas and in the few weeks that I was away from Pearl Harbor having been down to the South Pacific and back they had already gotten experimental equipment fitted in one of their ships so ready to learn, quick to act I thought they were most impressive in in that, in that particular way. Um, secondly, I was most, most favorably impressed by Admiral Nimitz, Nimitz, who saw us all, even a mere lowly commander. Um, he was willing to, to spend some time to, 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 to talk. However, when I got down to the South Pacific, I was sent by the Americans, appointed to USS Northampton, uh, which was uh, equivalent to our Washington-class cruisers built during the, in, in the interwar years. Eight-inch guns, 10,000 tons, or thereabouts. And the captain made me uh, comfortable by lending me his um, day cabin and retiring to his sea cabin, which was in the bridge structure. So I was uh, comfortably housed. And uh, shortly after I got there, um, written orders were received for an operation to take place about a week ahead uh, to intercept Japanese uh, reinforcements being uh, ferried down into Garel Canal from Rabaul, which was their main base. I was still on the bridge in the first Battle of Guadalcanal, which was November 13th, 1942. Oh. And November 13th, it was Friday the 13th. Mm. Our number was 445, which is 13. Mm. Our task force was 67, <laughs> 13. And we had 13 guns. And then two weeks later, we were back in it, still Guadalcanal, but it was the Battle of Tassiferanga. And we had five cruisers and three destroyers. We were the lead in this one. We had been the 13th ship, the oh. last one in the other mm -hmm. one. I, our ship was hard to believe. It was just, the skipper and exec just made that such a unit. It was just mm -hmm. tremendous. Mm -hmm. And these green kids, all of us were green. Everybody could do the job. It was mm -hmm. just amazing. Mm -hmm. So, a couple of... <laughs> Admirals, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> didn't do their job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Wow. But they didn't know about this surface search radar on, on wow. how much functioning we had that they didn't have. Mm. Tokyo Express, as they call it, was coming down from Central Pacific, you know, on a regular nightly schedule to replenish the supplies. I mean, for the garrison to block them down. They come in and, and the destroyers, a whole fleet of destroyers with, uh, with oil barrels filled with supplies in it sweep up near the shore and throw the barrels over and then pad to wash them up on the beach and that's how the Japanese were getting their their food and replenishments. And so they call it the Tokyo Express. I should have mentioned earlier on when we were discussing our briefing at Admiral Nimitz staff in Pearl Harbor. There was a, a Commander Lang appointed there as a British Naval representative on Admiral Nimitz's staff as a liaison officer. And uh, he had been out there for some while, and he'd been on board the Yorktown aircraft carrier when she was sunk. He said, I'll give you a free greatest and for nothing, two bits of advice if you go down to the South Pacific. One is, if you are sunk, keep your hat on, because you can't buy a, a British scrambled eggs hat west of Washington. And the other thing is, if you have to abandon ship, make sure that, that if a piece of line or whatever you go down on is long enough to reach the sea, because when he abandoned ship from the York Town, he went over the side and his bit of rope finished, 50 foot before he got down to sea level. So he had to abandon ship by air. We had a new admiral, and uh, we had, uh, I forget all the ships, we had the Salt Lake City, the Pensacola, the New Orleans, uh, the Honolulu. Uh, and Anyhow, we were in battle formation. Uh, the Northampton had a radar. We knew where the Japs were before we got there. We could tell how many yards they were. We were in a straight battle line and we were the last ship in the battle line because it was the flagship. And the destroyer commander, which they looked like the pierce of an error, request permission to fire their torpedoes at the enemy. We were in flank speed, right behind each other in a straight line. The new admiral waited, so I've heard many stories, it was from three minutes to four minutes. By that time, you passed, we passed the enemy and Admiral Tamaka, the Jap, and one destroyer turned around and fired a fan of all of his torpedoes. They knew what they were doing. I was on a damage control crew that night, standing on the main deck in the number four tutor. As I say, there was no moon, no stars, no light. But all of a sudden, the whole area became daylight and shell fire. Japanese come down the slot of water between the Solomon Islands and head for the sound called Iron Bottom because it is strewn with the hulks of dead ships, the bones of dead sailors, the Battle of Savo Island, the Battle of the Eastern Solomons, the Battle of Cape Esperance, the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands, the Naval Battle of Guadalcanal, the Battle of Tassaparanga, the Battle of
Battle of Rennell Island. Nights of inhuman ordeal and defeat. Nights of more than human valor and victory. The force of um, four sister ships of the, of the USS Northampton uh, with four destroyers uh, was sent up to uh, intercept uh, a, a Japanese force of uh, several destroyers. Um, the idea being to catch them just before they landed uh, uh, passengers and cargo uh, on the north northern uh, beaches of the island. And we were fairly near the shore. And the Jap, we had been told that they were coming down with a lot more supplies and a lot more men for Guadalcanal. Because we had the Marines there, but they were in pretty tough straits. Mm. And they changed the Admiral. Just before this battle, put Admiral Wright in charge. Well, nobody got anything squared away, but we still headed on up there. We had all the Jap ships between us and the beach. They were all destroyers, maybe seven or eight. And we could have been devastating to them on the torpedoes, and the Admiral would not let us open fire. Mm. Admiral Wright. He had just been put in charge by Halsey, mm. and that was devastating. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, as the Jap ships came down farther, they torpedoed every single one of our cruisers, heavy cruisers. Oh, mm. Every one of them got at least two torpedoes in them. Oh, one lost its bow, the Northampton was sunk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these uh, four Japanese Destroyers came down, or there was four at the time, and uh, <clears throat> they went right by us, and we we had our torpedoes trained out on them and ready to fire, and we had to get permission from the admiral, and he kept saying, "Are you sure it's the enemy? Are you sure it's the enemy?" Well, by the time we got permission to fire, the the, the Japanese were long gone, but we fired our torpedoes anyway but we didn't hit anything. Unfortunately, the timing was such that uh, our force must have been silhouetted against the rising moon because um, shortly after we established radar contact with the Japanese force, we saw torpedo wakes approaching the ship from the port bow and um, the Northampton was hit by two and um, she burst, uh, <coughs> uh, burst into flames. While we were busy firing away at this Japanese flotilla of uh, supply ships, this Japanese captain, he decides to break away from his group and makes a very wild speed run along our ports, our starboard side, and fired a whole array of fish, those lethal Japanese torpedoes. He hit the Minneapolis first, damaged her, and she was dead, started lo losing speed in the water, 
and and we were we were right after her, so as to to get out of her way, we made a turn which put us into the root of a, another group of torpedoes that hit us on the starboard side. And right between number one and number two turret. And that torpedo went in and ignited our ammunition, aviation fuel that was stored forward, and caused such terrible damage it just blew the whole bow off. The only thing between us and the sea was a, a bulkhead three-eighths of an inch thick. Of course, we were doing 30 knots at the time, so the, the, the abrupt loss of the bow naturally slowed us down, and then finally the engines were, were slowed down and to, it's finally stopped, or we were dead in the water. One of the things I remember about the uh, battle was that uh, I was the assistant uh, officer in the uh, director, which directed the five-inch guns. And uh, I was sitting on top of the director, and uh, nothing was happening with us, the five, with the five-inch guns, um, un until a, I heard this swooshing sound. And apparently one of the uh, shots that the enemy made uh, went over our head, and Ed Everton, who was fire controlman first class, reached up and grabbed me and says, Get down, you fool! And I did. Uh, I, I didn't mind taking orders from the first class any more than I did. But uh, the, the five inch battery uh, really didn't have any activity, it was just a waiting game for us, and when we got hit, of course, we were. Immobilized and uh, limped into uh, the lagoon there. Uh, I just remember there was uh, uh, an explosion of the uh, uh, aviation gasoline and the 8 inch powder magazine. I didn't know what had happened. This was 11.30 at night when we were supposed to open fire. and. Uh, I, really, I was on the battle station all night, so I really didn't know what had happened. And when daylight came, I looked up there and, and, and saw this metal up there. I had no idea what it was. And uh, then shortly after daybreak, well, we were able to see what happened. And I was up on the searchlight platform, the only man up there, because I was given orders, do not let those lights be energized. And I had everything blocked out. And I was watching the fireworks. All of a sudden, there was a tremendous explosion. I was blinded forward. It, was, it, it happened forward. I was blinded. My ears were blocked out. I couldn't hear. And I was wearing low quarter shoes like I'm wearing now. And we, the, the, I hope everyone knows what a combing is. That's a little thing around the base of a, of a platform or something. And there's drain tubes, yes. But then that filled with water because all the water came down, including a T-square. Where it came from, I do not know. It hit me on the head. I didn't have my helmet. I didn't have a helmet for some reason. But <laughs> anyway, I felt this water all around my ankles, and I said, my God, I think we're sinking. And I couldn't feel any motion. We stopped. So I said, had my May West life jacket on. I zipped, got it up tight. I said, well, you're supposed to jump over the side with your hands up around your chest and jump. And I did. And I landed on a teakwood deck between two five-inch gun mounts that went off the same time. Bam, bam. And I laid there. 
and I was shocked. And finally I came to, got my wits about me. If we weren't sinking, we we're dead in the water. I was on the bridge alongside the captain and uh, I saw the torpedo tracks myself but being after dark one didn't see them until they were too close and evading action was not effective. Uh, at the time it was not obvious where the torpedoes came from <clears throat> but uh, later discussion I think established quite clearly that it was Destroy, uh, torpedoes from the dis Japanese destroyer force that hit us and that um, they had the advantage over the American, over us in that um, they could see us against the, the moonlight whereas we could only see them uh, with, our, with our radar it seems that um, the ship was hit in or about the um, diesel fuel tanks Certainly the communication was lost between the bridge and the after turrets and um, so one had to rely on the officers at the after end of the ship taking the appropriate action for abandoning ship or what. After a relatively short time the ship heeled over and um, that meant that the um, boiler room fans were no longer able to go because they were designed for operating in an upright state. And once the boiler room fans had to be stopped, uh, the ship soon lost power and lost therefore the power to fire, fight fires or anything else. Um, I mentioned the division of the ship into two because um, to my mind it was uh, uh, indicative of good discipline that um, the people at the after end of the ship which must have been getting very hot uh, did not abandon the ship until they had instructions to do so and thereby saved many lives because this was in the dead of night um, the ship had been steaming at 20 knots so that even though the engines were not working she was still passing through the, sea, the water and if there hadn't been good discipline many people would have been lost the ship took about an hour to sink I would guess and uh, the destroyers who had been acting as our screen then returned from having chased the Japanese uh, destroy a force away and um, we were picked up with a loss of only about a hundred lives out of the 900 crew which considering the, the damage that was inflicted and the circumstances was, was highly creditable. And this, I, I asked what was happening and the guys on the five-inch gun mount port side said, you jumped off the search. Where'd you come from? I said, I jumped off the searchlight platform. Well, well, you got anything broken? I said, I don't know. Well, stand up. I said, I can't stand up. So they helped me. I stood up. My knees were hurting, but I felt okay. And I said, they said, well, there's lots of things happening up forward. I said, well, I better go up there and see if I can help. So I went up, and somebody grabbed me by the number two turret. He said, don't make another step. You'll walk into the sea. The bow was gone. Number two, number one turret was gone. We lost 300 people that night. Not only that, but the bow, when it was blown off, came around and made a left turn and went along our port side, banning us on the way, still afloat, ran into our outboard port side screw, jammed it, 
and cause all the big reduction gears to come right up off the deck plate in the engine room. And it twisted a, about a 10 inch drive shaft to the screw. I learned that part of the thing and I knew that we didn't have a bow. In the meantime, we had a little fire going on down there and all this. But we had the commander took over. His his station was the back aft, which was a secondary bridge. And uh, over our hangar deck, where we had four float, float, float planes that didn't come into action. But... Uh, and the commander had taken over because the captain and, and the bridge was out of commission. They, they just were not with it. Guadalcanal is a running wound through which both sides bleed. A hemorrhage of naval strength, of men, of materiel. You know, you have different different skills in the crew. I suppose they handle damage, different ship a curb. I was at my main job was an observer that night, sitting up there and watching the fireworks and listening to the torpedoes whistling through the water. But the uh, but one thing scared hell out of me, you know, the cruiser has. 15 six inch guns, five, three guns per turret, and five turrets. Their main battery and five inch, 25 secondary battery. But periodically, those six inch shells would hang fire. And they'd have to get them out of the turret before it exploded inside the turret. And my job <laughs> and that battle was grab the hang fires. As they dropped out of the turret and threw them overboard. And we went into this battle that night, and so we're going along pretty good in uh, 1121. We, we got hit with a torpedo, I know what that happened, and it blowed 165 foot of the ship off. And it flooded 212 foot back. I, but instead of sinking, it just stood on its head. And uh, man, I'll tell you, I would have been gone because I was below deck then. And uh, so they, uh, I was scared to death, you know, when it hit. And of course, the bow come around then and hit right where I was at. And had these plate glass mirrors in there where the barber shop was. And man, I'm telling you, it made a hell of a racket because it, it just scared, um, unnerved me something to say. Well, we got hit and uh, we fought fires. Uh, I know uh, for an hour and a half, we fought fire as bad as we could, but our own ammunition started blowing up. And finally, they said abandon ship. And uh, when we abandoned the group I was with, uh, we just walked into the water. I finished up in the sea uh, on the head of the, the Admiral, of uh, Captain Kitts, who was the, the captain of the Northampton. I was the last but one off, and we went down the paraben chains which are chains leading from the forefoot of the ship up onto the deck for the streaming of paraffins, which are an anti-mine device. And I knew that, it could, that would be going right to the bottom of the ship. And so I was taking a second bit of advice. This is the one question I asked the, the executive officer of the, the Northampton. He was abandoning the ship one below me, so to speak. So he got down to the water level before I did, and I found myself asking him, was it cold? <laughs> Even though one had no option, 
automatically came the question, was it cold? No, the water's quite pleasantly warm, uh, and uh, the only thing one felt anxious about was that uh, uh, whether any sharks going to come and uh, take off the bottom of one's leg or whatever. So one was anxious to get out of the water. The, uh, the diesel fuel was still burning. Uh, oil fuel was escaping from the oil fuel tanks and being set alight by the burning uh, diesel. So we were a, a very good bonfire for quite a long time. And uh, I suppose more by luck and, uh, than good management, um, we were able to keep on the windward side so that we weren't, didn't have this lot being blown down on top of us. So I had uh, a life belt which was adequate to support me and um, I had my arms to swim with and um, the destroyers took up a position such that they drifted down onto us rather than us having to swim after them being carried away by the wind. So that uh, I, was most imp- I was most impressed by the ability and the efficiency with which the, the Americans han- handled the situation. Um, there was a third bit of device which came not from, from Major Lang but from uh, general instructions in the, in the South Pacific force. If you do have to abandon ship in the South Pacific, don't lose your f- shoes because if you haven't got something on your feet when you get ashore over coral, you'll have your feet cut to bits. And so I remember to take my shoes off, but to tie them around my neck before, before, before we went into the water. And did you also have your hat on? And I kept my hat on. It had its, uh, its, its funny side because, um, as I said, the destroyers came back after about an hour to pick up survivors. And uh, they had the usual techniques of scrambling necks to help getting the people out of the water. And uh, the crew of the destroyer were down on the nets, help, uh, giving, giving one a hand up. And when I appeared there, uh, I heard a voice from the darkness just above me. Look here, look what I've got here, a bloody limey. As he saw it, I'd got a, an English hat, not, not an American one. So the little boy sitting on this barbette up there uh, had the phones on his head. And he said, well, they said the abandoned ships. He said, I don't know whether we are abandoned ships. I said, give me the phones, boy. <laughs> And I took the phones away from him, and I got a hold of this commander. And uh, he said, no, I said, we're, we're not going to ban the ship. I said, we're going to flood the magazine back there. I said, there ain't nothing wrong back here. I got men down there. And I'm the only one who can get them out. They can't get out if I don't get them out. So I said, there ain't nothing wrong. He said, well, you got a minute and a half is all you got to get them out. Because they already tripped the button. So. I jumped down below, about six foot down below there. They had an armored plate hatch door. And uh, so I just reached down and unlocked the thing and pulled it up with one hand and got the boys out real quick. And and they had, the boys come along the next morning and said, who, who opened this door? I said, I did. They said, how'd you do it? I said, hell, man, I jumped down there with one hand, done it one hand. That's how I done it. They looked at me a minute, you know, and said, you know how much that weighs to pick up? I said, was scared as I was last night, fella. I didn't have time to weigh it. But anyway, they said, well, it weighs 450 pounds to pick up. I said, it didn't weigh no 450 pounds last night, I guarantee you. Well, the group I was in, there's 10 of us formed a circle and they said, don't go ashore because the Japs are there. So we formed a circle and we got out into what they call iron the bottom iron bottom sound and they had a current. So we, we drifted pretty far as far as we could. And then uh, 
we were picked up like the rest of them by a destroyer. Uh, the Fletcher class. We picked up on that destroyer 700 men out of the water <laughs> in the middle of the night. <laughs> Dragon cork nets and everything. Yeah. Oh, when they write it up, they say how fabulous it was. <laughs> yeah. It's just, we couldn't even let them get up. They had to stay where they were or we would have rolled over. Oh. An extra 700 men on the ship, oh, I see. if they had gone to one side, oh, I we see. would have rolled right over. I see, sure. So we had to feed them on the way down there, mm -hmm. but they had to stay there and we brought the food to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Another ship picked up about 75. Mm -hmm. So we got 700. Mm -hmm. Supporting naval units repeatedly blasted Japanese sea forces, attempting to land reinforcements on Guadalcanal. The battle-hardened U.S. Navy was showing the standards of gunnery, daring and leadership that had long been its proud tradition. This series of attacks culminated in the memorable night engagements of November 1942, when warships slugged it out with each other in the darkness. wasn't assigned to a repair, a repair crew, but okay. cleaning up uh, and getting the bodies out and, and uh, cleaning up up there was an all-hands affair. All of us pitched in uh, to do that, and I just remember the smell uh, it was just horrible. Uh, and I remember the, uh, the ornament on my cap, uh, uh, the... the uh, the gases that were coming out uh, turned it black. How did we save the ship? I say we. How did the commander save the ship? We were close to an island that is named Tulagi. We're into Tulagi Harbor, and the decision was made to run the ship into the beach. In other words, grounded. And that's what we did. And that's what the commander did. And uh, the next morning, very early, the supply ship for the uh, uh, PT boats and a destroyer come alongside and render aid and and they send some divers down to cut away some of the exploded cigar effect of what was left of the hull of the ship forward of number two turret and they did a good job of that anyway the the procedure was then to remove the three rifles from the number two turret eight-inch rifles, stow them on the fantail aft to give us more balance and uh, do other emerge, emergency repairs by going ashore on Tulagi and cutting down logs and using them as shoring timbers to shore up the bulkhead, that three-eighths of an inch thick bulkhead underwater on the inside of the ship to keep the water from coming in bursting it in. It was an interesting aside. We were working, some of the, the seamen and all were working very diligently to camouflage the ship, to make it look like part of the jungle. So we sent up one of the float planes and the, radio, the operator radioed down, the pilot radioed down, he said, I hate to disturb, I hate to disappoint everybody, but What's been camouflaged looks like the, a heavy cruiser with the bow blown off, <laughs> beached into the <laughs> into the beach. So we were all disheartened about that. After I um, 
left the, the after the Northampton was removed from me, rather than me being removed from it, um, I was sent to another American uh, cruiser, the Honolulu, <clears throat> but then received instructions to return to Mombasa. Um, so I did much in, in reverse. I was debriefed by Admiral Limits. Um, uh, so I had a very comfortable Christmas uh, in Washington. Happy boy at home. 